When did you start to see that raging bull side of yourself when you were younger? I didn't. I don't think I did see it until um, the further you go up the ranks. So when you're a kid, everybody can pass, they kick, they all want to play. I wanted to be Wally Law, so everybody was playing 5-8. I was playing either 5-8 centre or lock until St George um, offered me a trial and I went down there and I made the Dragons and I didn't play lock. I went back straight in the back row and I will trying to make me a front row. So that's pretty much how much ability I had. So I knew that I would, couldn't play like you know, Alan Langer or Andrew Johns or Noel Goldthorpe or Anthony Mundine. So how I played was running really hard and be aggressive. So I actually had to teach myself that later on in life because I didn't have to play like that as a kid. No one, no one had to run hard as a kid. You get caught in trying to be that guy in the paper. I don't know whoever said that I was a raging bull, but then, you know, sometimes you get caught up with trying to be that guy sometimes. So it was fabricated. That's funny because a lot of people would just think you're one of those guys who gets the red mist and they just, yeah. they lose their control or get, get angry. But you're saying it was more something you just created for yourself. No, I was a skinny little kid. I was like, uh, like when I signed with the Dragons um, at six foot two or three or whatever, I was 86 kilo. So I never had the frame to play that way. So I would have got eaten up and spat out. So uh, I put on a few kilos and st still am today. So no, am um, I like... You know, I always wanted to be like Gene Miles or Wally Lewis, so I didn't want to play like a front rower, um, or a back rower back then. And you got exposure very early, didn't you, at a young age, into the Dragons side, coming off the bench in a grand final against the Broncos, yeah. ironically, against some of the guys that would end up being your long-term teammates when you eventually went there. But to, to get that early taste of defeat, what was that like? Yeah, it was strange that that really helped me through my whole career because it was the first real big game that I played. I actually played in the under-21s grand final the year before. Um, we got beaten and then to go and play against the Broncos and they were the best side all year and then they had a few injuries and then they limped in. They sort of, you know, were fifth and they were defending premiers and we were in a pretty good shape that year and then to get to the grand final and I know I was distracted because Tina Turner was in the tunnel mm. and I heard this commotion and I wanted to go see who it was, which means that I wasn't so, now in hindsight, I wasn't so focused on the game, but I was on the bench, but I still shouldn't have known what was going on around me. And then um, from that moment on, every big game I ever played, I made sure that I stayed in the dressing room. So, and just sat in my own space and it was about what I had to do in the next 40 or 50 minutes. I didn't overthink it, but I didn't care what was going on around me. It was a pretty good performance, but Tina, could you hear oh, it from the, yeah. from the tunnel? Yeah, yeah, no, Tina was great, actually, and then I remember, like, we're losing, and I don't have the photo, but she went and got a photo with the winners, which is, which is what you'd probably do, and uh, the Broncos have got a great photo with Tina in the, in the clubhouse, and it looks so cool, and she came over and got a photo with the Dragons, but I don't know who's got that photo. Can you please send it to us? <laughs> was it weird being a Queenslander playing against the Broncos? Did what? that feel... Strange? Yeah, absolutely, because um, that was the only club I ever wanted to play for because my hero, Wally Lewis, wore that jersey and my brother had signed um, <clears throat> signed there in, I think, 89 or whatever, so that was the only club that you wanted to play for um, and I didn't get the opportunity. Um, I had to go down to the Dragons, so watching Brisbane play, there was uh, probably a bit of jealousy that they were the best kids in Queensland, so that was, if you were... If you were a good player in any age group, you know, you always had a Broncos tracksuit or a hat or a scholarship and uh, I was overlooked for all that. So watching them play was a bit of jealousy, I suppose. Well, let's fast forward a couple of years because you sign with the Broncos, yeah. with the Super League coming in, yeah. but then it all ends up a bit <laughs> messed up is probably a fair way of summing it up. What's your recollection of signing with Brisbane and then how it played out with St George? Well, it was the only chance I was ever going to get to go home. Um, Super League and ARL, without going too deep into it, once you picked and signed with Super League, you could pick your team. And a couple of my mates had gone to Cronulla, a couple had gone to the Dogs and um, the Super League bosses at the time, I think it was John Rebo and David Gallup, um, they were trying to push me to one of the weaker franchises or newer franchises. And I knew that if I was signing Super League, I was going to Brisbane and that was it. So I actually sat in a holding pattern for about four, about four to six weeks because they didn't want me to go to Brisbane. They thought that it would have been stacking aside. And um, I think Shane Edwards, our CEO, goes, listen, there's a guy sitting at Super League and he won't play Super League. He'll go back to the ARL if 
you don't take him. And Wayne goes, well, I suppose I'll take him because he didn't really know me that much either. So, and then that was my opportunity to go play for the Broncos. So when you went to the Dragons and asked to be released yeah. to go, what was their immediate reaction? Um, we all voted 55 to 3 to go to Super League as a club, the Dragons. So I remember that meeting like it was yesterday, we were down in the old Chinese restaurant under the club and as a club we could all stay together and sign to go play Super League and, you know, we probably wouldn't have merged. We would have got enough money then and... Um, but they were a traditional club and they didn't want to move. And then uh, when I went to see them and I, uh, and I actually saw um, Jeff Carr and we had to go to court and I said, look, I've signed Super League and they're saying it's a $2 shelf company, it won't get up. I said, well, if it does, um, they said, we won't hold you back. And then obviously Jeff Carr got moved on and Brian Johnson, uh, the famous centre, uh, he became the new CEO and he said, I'm not going to release you, mate, you're too important. So... They didn't, and I was glad, and I've said it on radio since, that I think our game needs to show that stance again. I was a young kid, I had a contract, no one breached it. I was the one that was breaching it, and they made me sit out of here. When you landed in Brisbane and you went on to win the Super League title straight away, was that vindication for what you sat through and what you went through? No, I don't think it was. I, I was on the coattails of the great players there then. I think Stephen Neff scored a hat-trick and Lockie was great that night, and you know the Lazos and the Webkeys and the Walters and Langers, I was just a passenger. You know, I was still working really hard on my game. So I didn't feel like, you know, even though it was a great moment, it was emotional and, um, but there was two competitions. We didn't play against everybody. It wasn't the competition, you know, I wanted to play against the best players um, and test myself. So it was a great victory and no one can take that away from us, but it probably didn't feel as good as what Newcastle felt after theirs. Well, then coming back the next year yeah. and doing it again in the unified Competition. That was better. That was better? Yeah, absolutely. And I remember we played Newcastle in about round 10 or 11 and Wayne's not big on building us up. He was never big because emotion lasts for two minutes until you get hit under the ribs. But uh, I remember that week he said, boys, if you, know, if you want to cement and rubber stamp your grand final from last year, you're playing the Premier. So you want to go out there and do a good job on them tonight. And, uh, we beat Newcastle and I think that felt better, beating like the Premiers and then obviously going on and we beat the Dogs in the grand final. Uh, it was a tough year and that was a pretty good side. I, I, I'd say out of all the Broncos sides I've ever played with, that would be the best. I think, I think even in the history of the club, that one would be really hard to beat on you. If you stack them all up, those premierships, where, where do they all rank for you? Uh, they're probably all like children, but 2000 is my favourite because uh, I felt like we were a bigger part of it. You know, they were still the great players. Like, there was no elf, it was Kevy who was in and out, he was injured um, a lot that year. Uh, I captained probably half the games. So, and with Lockie and Webby and Wendell and Lottie and those guys, we felt like, you know, we were the senior guys now, you know, taking, you know, taking, the, taking the bull by the horns. Um, and Kevy was a fantastic leader for us that year because he wasn't at his best, you know, because he had so many injuries and he'd lost his, you know, co-pilot and Alfie, but he still led us tremendously. Coach off the field, Wayne. Yeah. There's two things people talk about when they talk about Wayne Bennett. They talk about the secret sense of humour that's <laughs> not seen to the public and then they talk about the man manager that could kind of whisper in your ear and get the best out of you. Was there a time where Wayne whispered in your ear and said the right thing and got what he needed out of you and that was the kind of display of what people see in him as a coach? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things about Wayne. The first time, because I was coached by Brian Smith and he's a great coach and he's a great educator, but it was very much a school teacher and a lot of information. And it's really hard to process and do that under fatigue. So when you're a young kid and trying to learn and you know, there's so many moving parts on a rugby league field and you're remembering uh, the game plan, it was a little bit hard early because um, I'd never played uh, in that sort of system. And then when I went to Brisbane, I remember before my first game, I woke up to Wayne and it's like about 20 minutes before we go, I said, hey, Wayne, what do you want me to do today? And I'm going to take you out the swear words. He goes, just play footy. But he threw a heap and I'm like, I'm more confused now than what I was with the <laughs> Brian Smith game plan. Um, so that was as simple as he wanted me, just to, like, no pressure. Um, but I remember I was sitting there one Origin and I'm sitting in the change room and you'd be really nervous. And he walked over and he goes, oh, Origin, special in. I said, yeah. He goes, who did you want to be when you were a kid? And I said, I always wanted to be Wally Lewis or Gene Miles or whoever played the best. He goes, just imagine if every kid wanted to be Gordon Tallis tomorrow. And that was a... 
you know, and then I'll, and I'm thinking, now there's more pressure on me sort of thing, but he would have those one-liners. But what Wayne would do is he'd make you train to your limit. He'd break you down and make you go further than what you thought you could go. And a couple of times we were doing these long runs and it's eight and a half K and it's at the Gap Reservoir and it's really tough and it's in the middle of, like, middle of Brisbane summer and it's really hot. You know, chickens lay hard-boiled eggs, it's that hot. <laughs> and Wayne would run and finish in the top five or three. Like, he used to win it, but when he was 50... So I don't know how many 50-year-olds could run and that was, you know, with the Lockies and I know Kevy holds the record out there, um, but there's some really fit guys and that's the respect that Wayne got off you because he could, you know, go as deep, you know, mentally um, as, um, um, as he wanted you to.